everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm honored to have Managed Sales Pro founder Carrie Simpson with us today. We are all in to learn some new great content from her. Before we get started though, uh, we'll go ahead and run through a few housekeeping items. Uh, we wanna make sure that this is as interactive as possible. So please put any questions or comments into the chat or Q&A boxes. I'll be keeping an eye on these throughout our time together. I also want to let you know that we are recording today's session. So if for any reason you need to leave us early, or if you want to share the information with a colleague, we will have a link available in the next 24 to 48 hours for you. Now, it is my honor to introduce to you the founder of Manage Sales Pro, a lead generating firm dedicated to providing new business opportunities for you, the MSP. Carrie Simpson, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks for the invitation, Erin. I always uh, appreciate being invited by Barracuda, and I uh, just wanted to say thank you to everybody that's taking a little bit of time out of their day to uh, be with us. I know that everyone's busy, and it's hard to find a spare hour, so let's use it as productively as possible, and I hope I can share some information with you today that you can take away and apply immediately. So we're going to get started. Um, again, my name is Carrie Simpson. I founded Managed Sales Pros in 2015. We are the only outbound only, telephone only lead generation firm in the channel these days. Um, I've been in telemarketing for 27 years, which I hate admitting in public, but it's true at this point. And we had some, we had some interesting experiences through the pandemic. Um, we had some clients who left us pretty immediately. We had some who hung on for a little while. We have some that stuck the course with us. I can tell you the ones that stuck the course are still doing very well. There was some, some things that we were surprised by, some things that we weren't surprised by. And now that the pandemic is ending, I want to talk a little bit about how you can use the telephone to develop more outbound opportunities for your MSP. Uh, so I want to share what was working before that you should keep, what was working before that you may want to reconsider based on today's sales environment. We're in one of the most unique times in history. Like I've never experienced something like this in my, my sales career. Even the uh, recession that started in 2008 doesn't compare to the rapid revenue loss that most small businesses experience. So we are prospecting in a time where it's kind of unprecedented and I hate using the, the catchphrases new normal and, but it, there really is a, a new business climate currently. And I've got a couple of suggestions that I think you might try for your business. And if the idea of outbound cold calling is terrifying to you at this point, I have a couple of kind of soft landings for you where you can get used to calling, making asks, and experiencing yeses or noes in less threatening environments or less fearful environments than flat out, uh, I've never spoken to this person cold calls. So what's still working? The fundamentals of prospecting never change. Successful prospecting requires a commitment to being consistent. It requires curiosity and empathy. You want to present your services based on value and choice and not sell on price, which is really hard to do when you're hemorrhaging revenue. So one of the things that our business had to look at when this happened was, are we going to discount to land new business so that we can keep the doors open? And uh, internally, we agreed that we would discount for any client currently on our roster that required a discount, but that we weren't going to discount moving forward. Uh, for anybody that wasn't a previous client. So we made the decision to deal with the revenue loss and not drop our prices so that we didn't have to try and make that revenue up when the pandemic ended. Of course, nobody knows when the pandemic is going to end or what the outcome is going to be like, but it's way easier for me to service four clients at my regular rate than it is for me to service eight clients at half of my rate. So I don't want to do more work for less money, and I don't think any of you guys want to either. So you really need to think about how are you presenting your proposals to people right now, and are you going to be flexible in pricing? And then we're going to talk about the basics, data, 
process, documentation, all of the pieces that you need to successfully prospect for your MSP. So none of those things have changed. Consistency is important simply because if you don't do it, it's not going to happen, right? You can assign it to someone else, but you're still going to have to be an accountability partner to that person. So if you're not the primary revenue driver and you're a managed service provider, you do have to identify the person who is going to be and keep them accountable and on task. You can't make a handful of phone calls on Monday and Thursday and hope that it's gonna result in new business next Friday. That isn't how prospecting works. You need a consistent approach applied regularly with daily, weekly, monthly metrics that you have to be accountable for. So that's the first thing I want people thinking about right now. How consistent are you in your prospecting initiatives? How consistent were you before the pandemic began? Before the pandemic, I would encourage people to sell uh, using a fear-based strategy around things like cybersecurity, right? There's a, a couple of approaches that we've used internally. Um, there is an approach that I call feel, felt, found, and then we add a fourth component, which is fear. So many of our clients felt that way. They found that this was the result. Now they feel like this, and then there's a big scary fear factor about what might happen if you don't implement the change. That worked really well before the pandemic, but right now, everybody's afraid. Right? You can't sell on fear when everyone's afraid of the exact same thing. Like We're all, as business owners, thinking, how long can I manage my business if the bottom continues to fall out of the market? How long can I keep my doors open if my clients keep leaving or if I can't find new business or if everybody's businesses have to shut down and go remote again? So the fear factor that you would normally use through the pandemic is so universal that there is no advantage to being a fear-based selling organization. Fear-mongering is just gonna get you blacklisted at this point because everybody's already afraid. You can't help them find the fear. Everybody's experiencing it every day. And I'm sure that those of you who are sitting on this webinar today have had those moments as well. We've all had the moments of like, we're gonna sit up at night, we're gonna bite our fingernails a little bit, we're gonna think about what might happen 12 months down the road. When my phone rings and it's a sales rep and they want to tell me about some scary thing that might happen to my business because of COVID, I'm just thinking like, you guys, read the room, right? I'm already there. I'm already worried about my business. I don't give a F. Look at that. I did not swear today. Everybody clap for me. I don't care about the thing that you're talking about. I care about whether or not I'm even going to have a business in a year. So selling at this point can't be a fear-driven opportunity. There has to be a value presented. There has to be a compelling reason to change. If everything's going to hell right now, why would I change anything? Why would I spend any more money? So put yourself in your client's shoes. Think about how you're approaching your own business right now. How would you like to be approached in the middle of this? You're hemorrhaging clients. You're losing revenue. You're uncertain about the future. Clients are canceling or just not paying their bills, right? You've already got so much fear on your plate right now that trying to poke holes in other things to be afraid of, like, I don't even care about a cyber attack right now. Like, yeah, it would also suck, but if your business is close to uh, closing anyway, that's the furthest thing from your mind. So previously, things were good, and you could start leading them through the, well, we're good with what we have right now. Well, are you? But right now when someone says, we're good with what we have, what they're saying is, I don't have the bandwidth to think about this right now. I'm too busy keeping the doors open. Uh, time sensitive offers. So before you were like, well, this price is gonna be good for, you put it on your proposals and this, this price is good for 30 days, or for us, I think we do, this price is good for seven days. Um, sometimes we do a webinar and we offer a special incentive to anybody that wants to decide right now or, you know, at the end of the quarter, sometimes we're pushing to make our numbers and we're going to offer things that we wouldn't uh, at other times of the year. So those time sensitive offers, people don't really have those. Like we're, we're approaching the market as if everyone has all the time in the world right now, but I am doing, you know, I was practically out of the day to day for my business before the pandemic hit. 
And now I'm back in it. Not only am I back in it, I'm busier than I've been in four or five years because some of our employees left, some of them have to work from home. Some of them are waiting out the pandemic because they don't feel safe in the office. So I'm not just doing my job, I'm doing three other jobs. I may not have time to review your time sensitive offer in a timely fashion. And my, my mental state in that case is going to be like, well, if I have to decide right now, my answer is no. So you can't really force people to close on things faster than you could previously. And whereas I might have taken like, hey, yeah, no, I'd love a little bit of a discount if I sign this month, or hey, if I pay for six months up front, do I get a discount? People aren't really looking at, you know, six months worth of anything right now. Everyone is dealing with the stuff right in front of them right now. And then obviously the things that were working before, drop-ins, going door to door, going to networking events. The ways that we used to get our name and our business card and our services out in front of people aren't there anymore. So you've got to find new ways to interact with your prospects. looking through a unique time. And the first one is only take high percentage shots. So eliminate anybody from your roster that would be a low ratio industry. So a high ratio industry to me is one user, one computer. So you want to find the highest percentage shots that you can take. This isn't the time to start looking for needles and haystacks and experimenting with weird niche industry. You want to go for the most popular, most common, easiest to find, easiest to isolate industries. So any company where there's a ratio of one person to one computer, where if they can't use their computers, they can't bill. So eliminate things like transportation, for example, because you can't identify just looking at that record or that lead, how many computers there are by the number of employees. Whereas if you're looking at things like law firms, if a law firm has 600 lawyers, that law firm has at least 600 computers. Right? With a transportation company, there might be five computers in the office and then 50 drivers who have no need for a computer. So you want to think about where are you going to get the most bang for your buck? Every dial needs to count. You've got a finite amount of time to do your prospecting, especially if you are a owner-led organization or an owner-sales-led organization. You've got a limited amount of time that you can prospect, and you have to make sure that each dial you make is meaningful. So don't go off on wild use cases looking for interesting retail opportunities. Retail stores are closing. Hospitality, they were hard to get in touch with to begin with, and now it's impossible to get them on the phone. So unless you're already niche specific, now is not the time to go hunting for weird niches to support. Stay with the tried and true verticals. Law firms, financial services, engineers, anybody that needs their computer to work and who can never get those billable hours back. That will increase the odds of your success significantly. So if you look at all things being equal, if you've got a list of 100 companies to call, and each of those companies is a high percentage shot company, your success rate is going to be significantly higher than if you take a list of 100 and you have to pick and choose which ones to call through there. So prepare before you start looking for new business. Make sure that your lists are error-free and filled with high percentage shots. If you're, are, if you're not already asking all of your clients for referrals every time you chat with them, now is the time to start. So not only does checking in with your clients right now give them the feeling like they can rely on you and they can trust you and you're there for them, even if they don't need anything from you, checking in on your clients regularly is a way that you can build value and more importantly, find new clients just like them. So I encourage everyone to reach out to their current clients on a regular basis. If it's the first time you've asked them for a referral, it's really important that you make sure that they are happy first. You should never ask a client that may not be satisfied with your services to provide you with a referral to one of their peers or suppliers. So think about the clients on your roster right now that you 100% know are happy with your services. You can start there. The clients that you know are unhappy with your services, 
you know, that's a completely different pile of leads and you're going to have to manage those differently. But those are your two outliers, right? Very happy clients and very unhappy clients. Your very happy clients are probably already bringing referrals to you. That's just by nature who they are and what they're like. Your very unhappy clients, they should probably be released back to industry before they further ruin your ranking in SEO or leave shitty reviews for you. Like if you've got clients that you just can't save and you can never make them happy, nobody wants to lose revenue right now, but you also don't want to deal with the fallout from clients bad mouthing you on the internet for the next three years because they had a terrible experience because you were short staffed through the COVID crisis. Lots of people are understanding. Lots of people get that you're struggling in the same way that they're struggling. But there is a small percentage of unreasonable clients who are going to expect the same level of service. And why shouldn't they? They're paying the same amount of money. You didn't give them a discount and your service levels are dropping. If they are loudly pushing back against that, and of course, why wouldn't they? It may be time for you to start segmenting your client base into clients that you want to release back to industry clients that you can ask for referrals. And now in the middle of that pile, we have an unknown list, right? We have people who aren't actively complaining and we have people who aren't actively praising. That is your biggest danger zone. So when you think about the list of your clients, I'm segmenting them out and you think about a client and you're like, you know what? I'm, we don't talk to them very often. They don't ask us for much. I guess they're a good client, but we don't know how happy they are. Before you go and ask them to refer someone to you, it's time to do a client check-in to identify, are they happy? Are they at risk? So there may be an opportunity for you to put up on a whiteboard every company on your client roster right now that you might be in danger of losing. And if you don't know that they're happy, they're in danger. So the easiest, as a company that does nothing but steal managed services contracts from one MSP to give them to another, because that's essentially our whole business model. We call people who already have a managed service provider. We present the value opportunity of another managed service provider. And we have learned how to poke holes in the service they're providing. We know how to find out if the SLA is shitty. We know how to find out whether or not the onboarding process was terrible. We know what the pitfalls are and we know how to look for them. And so does every other decent prospecting organization out there. So if you've got clients where you absolutely don't know whether or not they would take a call from a competitor, that's where you want to begin. You want to go in there and make sure you've shored up everything. You can do this constantly. Right? This is an account management rule. You go into your current client, you identify whether or not they're happy. If they're not happy, you fix it. And if they are happy, you ask for a referral. The way to go about doing that is pretty process driven. Once you get really good at this, you'll have referrals coming out of your ears. So first you share your growth strategy, right? You're talking to them as a peer, business to business, business owner to business owner. Here is my goal for the next five years. We wanna grow at this rate. We wanna do that in this industry. Right? What is your growth strategy? How do they play into that growth strategy? Right? We've got, you know, we're, we're developing a niche practice for law firms. We love working with you. We're so happy that you enjoy working with us. And we would like 20 more clients just like you over the next five years. Who in your network is looking for a new IT service provider? And more importantly, if you think about a trigger event referral, you're looking for people in their network specifically that are doing certain things. So when is it a great time to change IT providers? Well, if you're moving offices, that's a time to look at a new IT provider, right? You moved everybody remote, might be time to look at a new IT provider. Right? so you're looking for specific things and it's a whole lot easier to ask someone, who do you know that's moving offices in the next two years? I would like to talk to them, right? Asking them for something like that versus saying, do you know anyone who's looking for IT support? Like off the top of my head, no, no, not really. But if you asked me who in your business network is moving offices or who in your business network added people through the pandemic, right? So new employees being added at an above average pace might be time to look at a new IT provider. Scaling back might be time to look at a new IT provider. So think about those trigger events and ask your client who they know that is experiencing those things, those are the people that you want to be introduced to. 
and then prepare for that conversation. Before you ask them for those referrals, spend 10 minutes on their LinkedIn profile. Take a look at who they're connected to. Identify who you'd like to meet, because instead of asking them for a trigger event referral, you can just ask them to introduce you to a specific person. No, we love working with you. We've been with you for three years. We've watched you grow from 20 lawyers to 50, and it's been really exciting. I noticed that you're connected with Joe Smith from Smith, Smith & Stiff Law Firm. They're about the size that you were when you started working with us, and I'd love to talk to them about how we use technology to grow, to help you grow from 20 lawyers to 50 lawyers. Would you introduce me to Joe Smith, please? Right, so now you've kind of done all the work for them. They're not racking their brain trying to figure out who they could introduce you to. You've said flat out, thanks for your business. We love working with you. We want to work with other companies just like you. Can you please introduce me to this person so that we can give them amazing IT support as well? So think about ways that you can do that constantly. Every time you interact with someone, prepare for every conversation that you're going to have and identify ways in which you can like, get them to share their contacts with you. Suppliers, friends, people they golf with, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's a whole lot easier to call into a warm referral than it is to call into a cold lead. Make sure that you're doing the work. That's also important, right? Make sure that you're the one who's gonna make the phone call, send the email, whatever it is that needs to be done. Don't put the burden on them because now you're gonna to have to wait for them to get around to doing it. So yeah, I'm happy to introduce you to Joe Smith at Smith, Smith & Smith, but it's not really top of mind for me. And I'll get to it when I get to it, but you need leave now. So make sure that you're the one offering to do all the legwork to get that phone call to happen. Don't wait for them to email. Ask them if it's okay with them if you call them and mention their name. Make it super simple and make it super fast so that they still remember the conversation when you get around to talking to the person that you've asked them to refer you to. So a bad outcome is, oh, I was talking to Joe Smith at Smith, Smith and Smith, and he mentioned this, and they're like, who? And you wanna make sure that you're top of mind, not, with, not just with the person that you're calling, but with the person that you spoke to to get the introduction. So there's a hundred ways to approach referral requests, trigger events, and asking for specific introductions are the big takeaways there. Host free webinars. I can't stress this enough, right? We've got a couple hundred people registered for this one. And the secret that no one talks about is it doesn't matter how many people come to the webinar. The webinar is a red herring. You want the list. You want the list of people that registered for it. So you don't care if anybody comes to your event, but you need to be hosting them regularly so that you have something to talk about on your prospecting calls. So your primary reason for calling anyone is always to secure a face-to-face -face meeting. If you are calling a company that you've never spoken to and you get the CEO of that company on the phone and you're having a conversation with them, do not invite them to a webinar, invite them to meet with you. Even if you were calling to invite them to the webinar, now is the time to secure that face-to-face -face meeting because you might never get them on the phone again. Having a secondary or tertiary purpose to your outbound calling, that's event invitations. And back in the day, I would say, take them to lunch, get them to a sporting event, bring them to a cocktail party, host something interesting that they can attend. Since we can't do that right now, Virtual events are the next best thing. And I know that we're all Zoom meeting out, but the point of having that meeting isn't to present live to 100 people at once. The purpose of that meeting is to present live to anyone who shows up and then have 100 people that you can follow up with until the dawn of time, right? If they were interested enough to register, maybe they just couldn't make it. There's 100 reasons why people don't go to events after they register for them, but it doesn't matter now because you have expressed opt-in permission to market to them. And when people don't go to something that they've committed to going to, they feel a little guilty about it and they're more inclined to take your call afterwards. So think about the content that you can deliver that is unique to you but valuable to prospects. 
right? What can you talk about that people need to know about right now? It shouldn't be salesy. Nobody wants to sit through an hour long sales pitch. There should be value. What can you teach them? What can you share with them? And there's a hundred great things that you can do here. And one of the webinars that I like the most in the managed services industry isn't even focused on business. Before the school year begins, it's time to start talking to your kids about security and the devices that they use for their schoolwork. Right? How do you keep your kids safe online? Who's more qualified to talk about how to keep people safe online than an IT service provider? Right? That's a great bit of content. It's easy to put together. You put together 10 slides, 10 tips, you're done. You deliver it, people are appreciative and they start thinking out of the box a little bit. So when you're thinking about putting together a webinar, don't necessarily think about how can I get these people to buy something from me on this webinar today, right now? It's a long game. What you're looking for here is how can I be perceived as somebody in the industry that is invested in the success of not only my business, but of the industry as a whole, of my community, of my city, of the people that are nearby me? How do I become a good corporate citizen? How do I become that guy that people rely on for stuff? Right? That is something that you want to consider in any sales and marketing program that you're putting together for the next year. What events can you host around or what topics can you speak to that aren't necessarily building your business, but are definitely building your value or the perception of your expertise in your community? Take that a step further. Who can you share it with and how can you share it with the most people at one time? So instead of calling people one at a time to invite them, what associations do you already belong to? What community groups are you already participating in? When I think about things like my kid's school. So we live three blocks away from my kid's school. Uh, we live in a fairly modest neighborhood, but we are surrounded, like we're kind of an intake neighborhood for some of the wealthier neighborhoods and all of their kids go to the same school as my kids. So most of the business owners in Winnipeg, Manitoba live within a two mile radius of the school that my kid goes to. You better believe that we donate things to those events and we participate in all kinds of things, right? Because the parents of the children at the school are seeing those things constantly. So think about how you can connect not just with one person at a time or one business at a time, but what community groups is there are there you know community hockey programs are there sporting events now again with covid we've got some really unique and strange things happening can you volunteer to help schools get set up for a remote learning year never mind how do i make money off this how do i get my company name in front of the parents of every child that goes to that school that's 500 people who have 500 jobs for 500 businesses in your community and I, some communities that might all work for the same place, but most of the time you're going to have a huge reach for those things. So think about any place where you can engage with multiple people at once. Associations are great for that. If you're offering free content to them, free articles, free webinars, free guest posts, write them an ebook, whatever it is that you're excited to share. What are you like? What what gets you super enthusiastic about your business? If it's security, great. Start developing content around security. Give it a unique voice. Make sure it's yours. Don't buy content from some company that's generating the same article for a hundred of your competitors and you. This is something that you have to put your own unique spin on. If you need some ideas, just start Googling. See what your competitors are doing in your city. See what other companies that you admire are doing in other cities. Talk to your peers. One of the things that I love about the Managed Services channel is the willingness that everyone has to share knowledge with the people coming up behind them. So just because you haven't got it figured out doesn't mean that one of your competitors won't help you. Um, I have a mentor who owns a call center that's about 10 times the size of mine. We compete for your business all the time. They're located in Austin, Texas, and they're great guys. We work in one vertical, they work in 12. Uh, we work doing one thing exclusively, and our business model is a little bit different, but essentially we're doing the same thing. 
and all of the problems that I have in my business, Tim has had at some point in his business. So going to him and asking him for a recommendation on how I should solve a problem or where I might think about advertising, he's always happy to help. So just because one person blows you off doesn't mean that other competitors aren't in it for the good of the industry. One of the things that I've noticed, especially in our industry, is that the better my competitors are, the more likely people are to buy from any of us. The crappier your competitors are, the more gun shy people will be to buy from you. So don't worry about your content getting into the hands of your competitors and think about how you can engage with them. I mean, you may not want to be in a peer group with eight MSPs from the same city, but I mean, I sit down for cigars with eight different MSPs that live in Las Vegas all the time. They're friendly with each other. They talk about the clients that they've lost. They talk about the clients that they lost to each other. Right? There is no need to alienate people or especially at a time where everybody's kind of trying to solve the same problem. Put your heads together and try and solve it. Become an expert in your city, become an expert in your community, become the person that people think about first in the niche that you're focused on. So one of our clients, uh, Jim Turner from Hilltop Consultants, went niche specific ages ago. He is probably the premier MSP for law firms um, in the eastern part of the US. And he gives back more than anyone else I know. He is always happy to have a conversation with somebody that's trying to start an MSP or has already started an MSP and is struggling. And I know that there are hundreds more just like him out there. So make sure that you're tapping into the resources that are available to you for free. And offer to speak at people's virtual events, even if you're sick of them now, right? If your local law association is having some sort of virtual event, how do you get on their roster? How do you participate? Start calling people and offering them content. Offer, a, offer them articles, offer them your time, offer to meet with them. Right? Any way that you can get your name in front of hundreds of people at once is a great way to prospect, especially when you're trying to replace revenue quickly. I always want to think of like, maybe the way the channel works, right? There are lots of ways like this, right? Like I'm on a webinar now that I didn't have to plan, that I didn't create, that I didn't host, where I get to talk to a couple of hundred prospects at one time. And all I had to do was make one phone call to Barracuda and say, hey, I'd like to do a webinar about this. Would you like to host it? So think about the people in your network that have access to the people that you want to talk to and see if you can provide them with a webinar that provides value for their friends, clients, prospects, students, whatever you have. This one's important. Create a consistent and positive user experience. So never mind finding new clients right now. Let's make sure that none of your old clients are going to leave. So whether it's a prospect calling in or a client calling in, what kind of experience are they having when they're calling into your company? And as a telemarketing agency that calls MSPs all day, every day, I can tell you that only 5% of you are answering your phone live. It immediately differentiates you from your competitors. It doesn't cost very much, and it's very satisfying. So if you think about the experience that a prospect has when they're looking for a new provider. So people calling you, those are gimme. And if you lose them, shame on you. The quickest way to lose them is to not treat them as prized possessions from the minute they waltz in the door. So dumping them into a generic voicemail that says, hi there, you've reached sales. Beep. Like as somebody who's looking for a service, that isn't something that generates a great amount of um, confidence, especially if you think about the reasons that people are gonna be leaving their managed service providers during a pandemic. So. Think about your own clients. Think about the clients that have called you recently. Why are they leaving? Are they leaving because they're not getting the service that they used to get? And this happens pretty regularly, right? There are almost, so we call them here at Menace Sales Firms, we call them growth years and process years. On a growth year, we're gonna lose some business because our service level drops because we're signing business, signing business, signing business, signing business. Right? On a strategy year, 
we don't lose anybody, but we also don't grow the same way because all we're doing is honing our service, honing our service, honing our service. So we always alternate between growth, growth years and service years, mostly because Tracy makes me do that. But if you think about it strategically, there are going to be times where you're going to have huge drop, a huge drop in service levels. So if you, for example, had to furlough a bunch of your team during the pandemic, and now you have fewer people supporting your clients, they're getting a little bitchy because your service levels aren't what they used to be, and that's what makes them think about leaving. If they call another MSP, and that MSP answers the phone live and immediately, and greets them, and they've got their process dialed in, that's already heads and tails above what they're experiencing elsewhere. Just having someone answer the phone brings relief. So I can't stress this enough. If you don't have it in your budget, start thinking about even using an answering service, somebody that's gonna give a face and a voice to your business. And if you're spending money on SEO or any sort of lead generation activity, and you're not answering your phone live, you may as well be throwing that money in the garbage. Right? Not everybody wants to fill out a form. Not everybody wants to email for information. Some people just want to pick up the phone and call you. Think about the age group that you're selling into. Know your audience. Right? I am 47. I didn't have a computer at my desk until I was in my late 20s, and I was in sales. So I do business on the phone. If I can't reach you to buy something, I definitely am not gonna be able to reach you when it comes time to get support from you. And that's the way my mind works. Most of the people that you're trying to sell to are in my age group. They're not in their 20s and 30s. They're in their 40s, 50s, 60s. And they're still doing business the way that they wanna do business. So you need to meet your prospects where they wanna be met. And that's, that's the phone. You need to be providing that service to them. Take that one step further, use scripts to train your team so that everyone has the exact same experience. Outbound calls, inbound calls, right? You wouldn't have a support team where one person took support, um, handled support requests this way and someone else handled them that way. You want a standardized approach to your support. You wanna use a standardized approach to your sales as well. And when somebody calls into your company, you want them to have the exact same experience, whether you as the business owner answer the phone or your receptionist answers the phone or somebody from your help desk answers the phone. It should always sound the same. It should always sound, you shouldn't sound stressed, right? Like I have called people before and they pick up their phone, what? Like, okay, well, I guess you're having a bad day and I guess we're not gonna do business together, right? That may seem like a common sense thing to talk about, but everybody should be answering the phone like they just walked into the office five minutes ago and they walked in and they had their favorite Starbucks latte waiting for them. I don't know, somebody repainted their office and there's like donuts on their desk, right? Like, oh, wow, hi, right? Like you should be excited when people call you. And if it's a vendor, so what? If it's a telemarketing call, so what? Be pleasant to them too and move on with your day. You don't have to take telemarketing calls, but you don't have to be shitty to the people that call you either. Start documenting everything that you're doing so that you can refer to previous discussions on calls. So if you're prospecting for new business and you find out that Sally's daughter got into Harvard, the first thing you should be putting into your notes is call Sally in two weeks. Ask how her daughter's transition to Harvard went. This differentiates you from every sales rep that she's spoken to in the last several months. Right? Don't ask her if they're ready to buy it. Just ask her how her daughter's doing at Harvard. Little notes like that, little differentiators, those are the things that help people decide that you are the partner for them. You're already showing that you're interested in them. You're engaged, you're excited to be talking to them, and more importantly, you're paying attention. If somebody is thinking about leaving their current provider because their service is poor and they don't feel important, the company that answers the phone live and remembers the conversations that they have now looks like a really good option. So first of all, don't be the guy that they're thinking about leaving. Make sure that all of your clients are feeling special and valued right now. 
And if somebody else's clients are thinking about leaving, make them feel special and valued too, and soon they're gonna be your clients. When you're creating consistency, you wanna think about the things that require you to do them. So what do you need to personalize, right? For me, I never send emails that are um, templated unless somebody says, hey, can you send me something? And then, yeah, I just push a button and that email goes. But I personalize most of my interactions with prospects. But I automate things like scheduling follow-up. So our system is set up so it'll automatically schedule a follow-up call based on whatever outcome that call had. So I've automated everything that I can and personalized everything that I feel is important. So think about what's important to you and then go have conversations with 10 other people who aren't you, who didn't go to school with you, who haven't been your buddies for 10 years, who you don't have beers with on the weekends, because you want to understand how everybody experiences things, not just people who are exactly like you doing exactly what you do, right? You could talk to 10 IT business owners and get the exact same question, but why don't you go talk to a lawyer, an accountant, an engineer, learn their founder stories, figure out why they started their businesses, figure out what their goals are, and then think about how do you personalize experiences for people who think differently than you? Because I think our biggest challenge when it comes to prospecting and outbound lead generation is that we assume everybody is gonna buy the way that we do. And obviously I'm invested in your decision to use a third party telemarketing agency at some point in the future. So don't ask me what I think, right? I'm invested in you spending money with managed sales pros. Go talk to 10 people in your network that maybe you don't hang out with on a regular basis and find out what makes them tick. Find out how they would like to be approached. Find out how they gather information and how they make buying decisions. And once you start seeing common things, those are the things that you hone in on and those are the things that you perfect, right? You can't please everyone. You're not gonna please everyone, but you can please some people and the ones that you want the most are the ones who think like your best clients already. Then think about your current clients and think about how do you delight and fascinate the people that are already on your client roster, right? It's great to sign a new business, but if all you're doing is uh, filling a leaky bucket, your business is never gonna grow. So you need to be focused, unfortunately, all the time, every day on user experience whether it's a client or a prospect, how are they feeling after they've interacted with you? You wanna make that consistent and positive. And the last thing I would suggest is to revisit your closed lost file, right? So any bid that you lost over the last five years, now's the time to give them a call, right? If you're trying to get your like get yourself ready to cold call, right? Like let's say that the idea of cold calling is terrifying to you. You don't really like the idea, but you're seeing it work for other people. So you want to give it a shot. Start by calling people that already know and like you. These people liked you enough to invite you to bid. They didn't choose you, but they still liked you. Check in with them. How are things going? How did your company experience the pandemic? What are you going to do in the next six months? What's changing? Right, and then talk a little bit about what are they doing for IT and what could you do to win their business next time? If you're lucky, it's time for them to tender that bid again. And if you're not, well, maybe you have to wait a year, but now you've opened the door again. So we call this restraining order prospecting, right? You don't win the deal, they just go back into the pile and you start calling them again and you check in on them every six months. How's it going? Is there an opportunity for us? What would we need to do your what would we need to do to win your business? Has anything changed? This is a big one, especially if you've never prospected before. Manage your time and manage your expectations. Right? It takes about 20 hours of prospecting to get one meeting. And I'm talking about like purely cold. We've never talked to these people. We don't know anything about them. But it, that takes 20 hours. And you need to talk to the right person and you need to be in the right place at the right time, which seems uh, common knowledge, but if you just think for a minute about the number of times somebody said, hey, yeah, no, well, I'm busy right now. Can you call me next Tuesday? And you're like, yeah, no problem. I'll call you next Tuesday. And then something came up on Tuesday and you pushed that. Then you pushed it another week and then you pushed it another week. 
I don't know if this ever happened to you, but it's happened to us. And I got to tell you, our clients are pretty angry when it does. If we push a follow-up activity and they talk to a competitor in between the time that we first spoke with them and the time we finally get around to uh, talk to them and they sign on with someone else in that period of time, I have a lot of explaining to do because that lead was very, very clear with me. He said, call me next Tuesday. And I was like, eh, I'm not going to do that. I'm busy today. I got lots of other stuff to do. When someone asks you to do something, one of the ways that you develop trust and rapport with them is by doing the thing that you said that you'd do. But it's going to take you 20 of hours, 20 hours of doing the things that you said that you would do to get to that one meeting. The better your data is to begin with, the better your meetings will be, the more sales opportunities you'll have. So start with clean data. Approach all of your interactions with your goal in mind. Right? If you need one sale every X amount of time to hit your goal. I don't know what your goals are. I don't know, like that's a very personal thing, but once you know what that is, work backwards from it. That'll tell you how many calls you need to make, how many meetings you need to get, how many proposals you need to write, right? Once you know those numbers, every time you dial the phone, you're getting one point closer to where you need to be. But if you don't know where you're going, it doesn't matter where you are right now. So think about how you can create a process that's measurable, that you can improve on a regular basis, so that you can find that needle in the haystack, close that new piece of business, and then carry right on to the next one. So how can Man Sales Pros help you? Well, we have a full suite of offerings, including done for you sales prospecting. The idea of making cold calls is completely unappealing to you, but you wanna get that done, we're happy to help you. We also provide companies with lead generation, meaning we identify opportunities for you and you take them from there. Uh, we create lists for companies. We train sales leaders. We train sales teams. We develop process and playbooks and we're available for consulting from time to time. If anybody has any questions, I am open to answering them now. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Yes, we've had a few questions come in, Carrie. Um, so one of them, when you were, uh, towards the beginning, when you're talking about finding new business uh, via asking those specific questions, um, we were asked, what if, what if the client or, you know, that current client wants to keep their contact list blocked as many of them do, how would you kind of work around that? Um, sorry. So whoever asked that question, if they can kind of roll back what they mean by that. So on LinkedIn, there are no blocked you can't really block your contact list from other people. Are you saying if people are, are, don't want to share information with you? Correct. Yeah. I think at that point, if they don't want to share it with you, then you just say thank you and move on. Like you don't really, that's not a time to objection handle, right? They're already clients of yours. You really don't want to start like, oh, come on. Really? Like if they say no, they're not comfortable with that, that's fine. But I would start being worried about whether or not that client was truly as happy with your services as you think that they are. Because if I've been working with a client for four or five years, they're walking leads to my door. And if I'm asking them to refer me to people, they're walking me right to their peer group. Perfect, definitely. Um, also, um, how many times do you normally try to prospect before you give up or, or move on? Uh, I mean, we have unlimited resources for that, so forever. <laughs> I love it. I feel like I'm, I'm that way. I see people at trade shows all the time and I feel like I see the same people over and over. And I, one day I will get them. It is a goal to get them to become a partner. <laughs> but we do prioritize. So when we're calling into the managed services market, so if I'm calling on behalf of data, for example, or on behalf of MSP CFO, um, and we're calling into the MSP space, we already know who picks up their phone and who doesn't. So we prioritize the people that answer their phones far, uh, far higher than the people that don't. And our, the database that we use is smart enough to know that this person answers their phone at three o'clock regularly, this person opens, answers their phone at 8 a.m. So our system will prioritize the dials based on who usually answers their phone or answers emails or whatever, right? Like the, the AI available in some of the processing systems right now is so, so smart that it will just do all that work for you. But we will, we call it like restraining order, buy or die. We call it buy or die. So 
if I'm prospecting for an MSP, it's not my job to decide how many times is enough, especially if that MSP really wants that deal, right? I'll try and find another way in. So if I can't get someone on the phone, I'm dialing zero to see if I can get to the receptionist. I'm punching in common names into the IVR to see if I can connect with somebody whose last name is Smith or Simpson or John or Joe or whatever, right? Like there's lots of ways around that. I'm looking to see who they know on LinkedIn so I can kind of uh, ask and tell their people to refer them to me. Awesome. You, you just mentioned calling into the MSP industry, but uh, what is one of, you know, what do you think is the easiest industry to call into? For MSPs? Uh, just in general. Uh, I Service, anybody that needs to answer their phone to win business is a better bet than people that don't. Right, so if you think about highly competitive, so if you're gonna call, like, think about your own experience. Like when you call a company and you're looking for something, who are the easiest companies to reach? Who are you waiting for callbacks from versus who picks up the phone right away? Right, so if I need a plumber, all those guys are using answering services. If I need a lawyer, probably someone's answering the phone and fielding those calls. All right, we just have a few more. Um, what's one of the best prospecting stories uh, so far with, uh, with the pandemic? Oh, like, what I liked most about it is the way that people weren't, like people didn't set up their phone systems very carefully when they moved home. So we had calls where the, the generic phone number had been forwarded to the CEO's cell phone. And he was losing his mind. He was like, why are you calling me? How did you get this number? And I was like, buddy, I called this phone number and you answered. It sounds to me like your IT company forwarded your phones to your cell phone. He's like, well, I like, well, you know, that isn't common practice. And it sounds like there's probably some other things that they're not doing that are uh, doing or not doing that might not be common practice. Would it make sense for you to have a conversation with another IT company? And he's like, yeah, I'd like to talk to someone else. <laughs> so just like that one little flaw, like whatever that was. And I'm sure like when I think about like the our MSP moved us home over a weekend, right? He moved all my callers home. He set up our VPN. Right, like I am very grateful for how quickly they were able to respond. But of course, there was a few things that got mixed that got missed in that kind of hasty move. This particular one, this guy was so angry about it that he was prepared to meet with another company. Those gimmies don't come along very often, so <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, no, but like I got a meeting from the CEO of a 70 seat law firm just because I called in and their IT company had forwarded the phones incorrectly. Wow. Wow. And uh, lastly, um, how much do you, um, a managed sales pros, uh, charge for, for sales prospecting? For our full service managed service of sales prospecting, it's $6,000 a month. And we're geographically exclusive in those markets. So we're not available in every city in North America. Um, we have we just never found a way to ethically support more than one MSP in any area, so it's probably worth giving us a call just to identify one whether or not the territory you're in is open, um, and then it's a an annual commitment at six thousand dollars a month. And we like to remind people that it's it takes about a year to see ROI from telemarketing. Some people get lucky and they start hitting on uh, closes right away, but that is the exception and not the rule. So three months of prospecting is not going to get you anything. So wh whether you're thinking about doing it with Man of Sales Pros or one of our competitors or bringing someone in house, it's a long game and you gotta be patient. Definitely, well that kind of wraps up our Q&A session. Uh, Carrie, thank you so much for your time today. This was great. Um, thank you everyone for, for hanging out with us and listening to this. As I mentioned, we'll, we'll have a recorded link available for you in the next 24, 48 hours. Um, if you have any other questions, here's Carrie's information, as well as feel free to reach out to us at barracudamsp.com, and we'll be happy to help field some of those questions for you. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great afternoon and a great day. Thanks, everyone.